I don't need that. I need, oh, I need that. Go away. It's going to be weight. What? Right? What are we talking about? So how would you feel, given that I'm not assigning a homework the Thursday before spring break, if we made this lecture pre-recorded online? I'd say you're a hell of a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and a damn good man. <laughs> oh my goodness see yeah, I think what I'm going to do is pre-record that lecture on beam deflections now here's the deal okay when we come back to the world I guess on the 29th of March we're going to pick up okay so the only thing I would ask is watch it by then you know and as long as you do that we can come back ready to go I'm happy can uh, homework six be due on like next Friday or something? Yeah. Oh, what are you pushing that for? Wait, wait, are you talking about like the after the exam? The one that was due, no, 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 the one that was due next Thursday. You want it to do next Friday? Yeah. You want another day? Yeah. Another one day? Yes. There's very good reasons. Yeah. There's, yeah. Uh, I feel like I know what that is. There's, there's <laughs> an physics <laughs> exam on Thursday and a physics exam Friday. I'd love for it to be due Friday night. Whatever you decide is fine with me, just so we're aware. <laughs> <laughs> right, also, if you won't cry, you're sure. still beautiful no matter what. Yeah, yeah. You're like a group father figure. I hope you realize that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the caffeine is flowing this morning. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm in a giving mood Friday at midnight. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. It's like I said. Why are you? <laughs> okay. Then with that, let's get into composite bean land. So, we're all in agreement. Thursday, March 10th, the lecture will be pre-recorded. Homework 6 will be due Friday at midnight. I, in all seriousness, I do not want it to be done um, before spring break. Like or after spring break, uh, because like I want I want the homework complete so that we can grade it, and by the time we come back, it's like okay, now let's just focus on the exam. So, um, so yeah, Friday at midnight, I'm okay with that. Okay, let's recap. Bending stresses. How are we feeling about the theory, the ideas, the concepts, the the, the fundamental expression sigma equals m y over i. Um, what we're basically saying with bending stresses is that the bending stress is um, neutral at the neutral axis, where the centroid is. There, is. there is no bending stress. Above or below the centroid, we generate bending stress. The further away we get from the centroid, the more the bending stresses are. Okay? Now, we get uh, uh, that definition, or that the, the definition of those stresses at some distance y from the centroid is sigma equals my over i. And being the applied moment, uh, I being the moment of inertia, Y the distance from the centroid. 
Now, um, obviously it would make sense that the extreme worst case stresses are at either the top or the bottom. And so we define C as the extreme fiber distance, uh, C from the centroid to the very top or C from the centroid to the very bottom. And so we can define section moduli to simplify that computation. Okay, uh, with me so far on that? Did everybody have any, anybody have any concept issues with that? Okay, now, um, today what we're going to do is um, recognize a flaw in this theory. Okay, this theory uh, and, and this expression sigma equals my over i is derived assuming that the beam is comprised of a single material, that it is a homogeneous in nature. But in very real instances, we have beams comprised of more than one material. We have composite beams, okay? And sigma equals my over i doesn't really work when you have beams of two materials. So what we're going to do is transform it into a beam of one material. And so we're going to use a transform section method uh, in order to handle that. Okay? So I want to talk about stresses in composite beams. And the other thing that's worth mentioning about stresses in composite beams is that um, sigma equals mc over i may not be as useful as sigma equals my over i. In other words, we may need to determine stresses at the interface, not the top and very bottom. And so we... And you're going to see that uh, here uh, in a little bit. So first off, I want to make sure everybody's clear of what, I'm, what I mean when I say a composite beam. It is very common that we have beams in engineering system applications that are comprised of more than one material. Now, I will admit to the uh, folks in the room that when we did power-torque relationships, that was more applicable to the mechanical engineers in the room. This is probably more applicable to the civil engineers in the room. But there are some very real instances where we would utilize beams of more than one material. For example, if we were using, let's say, a glue lamb beam, a glued laminated timber uh, flexural element, um, it's very common to take strips of timber and then glue them and press them into a laminated support beam. Okay? And when we do that, let me ask you a question. If we were looking, if we were trying to classify our wood, would we put the better species of wood in the middle or the better species of wood on the top and bottom? Top and, top and bottom. That's where the higher flexural stresses are. There's a reason I'm not civil. <laughs> Sigma equals M Y over I indicates that the uh, lowest flexural stresses are near the centroid, near the middle. So if I was arranging uh, wood for a glued laminated timber uh, flexural element, I would put the best wood at the top and the bottom. Okay? Yes. Now, that is one example of a composite beam. Here's another example of a composite beam. And this is the example that your homework is going to be uh, focused on. This is a, uh, a, a, a support uh, beam in a common you know, steel frame structure. So we have a steel, beam, a steel beam that is supporting a concrete slab. How many of you have had DOH internships uh, working over the summer? Have you ever seen these little nail looking things sticking out of a steel beam uh, before? Or even if you're driving around you see them pouring a concrete deck. Look at the steel beams and you'll see these like big, thick, nail-looking things uh, on top of the uh, steel beam. Those are called shear studs, okay? What happens is as the concrete is placed and as the concrete cures, the concrete locks with these shear studs and we have a composite beam as a result. There's a reason that we call them shear studs and that will actually become a lot clearer uh, during Tuesday's lecture when we talk about transverse shears because under flexure, these, this concrete beam and this uh, steel, uh, uh, this concrete slab and the steel beam are going to want to slide against one another. A perfect example of that is to take your notebook and bend it. The pages are sliding against one another. If I were to take your notebook and glue the pages together, it would suddenly become a lot more flexurally stiff because now the pages are resisting that transverse shear. And that's what's happening here. Okay? But the problem is, is that this formula doesn't work when you have a beam comprised of a single, uh, of more than one material. That, that formula is, is invalid because when we derive sigma equals my over i, we assume the beam of a single material. But we got to deal with this. This is what happens in the real world. So how do we bend this formula to our will, as it were? Okay? And the answer is we use a transform section analogy. 
So let me explain how this works. So what I'm going to do for the sake of my derivation is I'm going to assume that we have a wooden beam that's reinforced by steel plates. Okay, And the reason I'm using wood and steel is because I think it's pretty easy to understand which material is stronger. Which material is stronger? The steel, right? The other thing that's worth mentioning is that it's very clear that um, I'm placing the steel where I want to place it, right? Under flexure, the largest bending stresses are going to occur at the top and bottom. So I'm going to put steel where it's most effective, right? Now, if you recall our assumption of strain compatibility, we talked about this last time, but I said it's not really going to matter very much uh, in terms of a homogeneous beam, but it is going to matter for a composite beam. I propose that all of the deformations, the strains, are linearly proportional. And we've used this concept before in this class, when we've had a composite column. And we take the column and we squish it. It's an aluminum column uh, sheathed by brass, and we uh, uh, load it in compression. We were able to solve that problem by using a compatibility relationship. We recognized that the deformation in the aluminum and the deformation in the brass were the same. Okay? Well, I propose that the strain in the steel and the strain in the wood are going to be the same if the beams are behaving truly compositely. So what we're going to do is assume a linear strain profile. See, before we were talking about a linear stress profile, so let me go back here. So these were the stresses linear from the centroid. Now we'll say the strains are linear from the centroid uh, as well. Okay, with me so far? Now, what I mean by linear is I'm talking about Hooke's Law. So, in other words, the stress in the wood equals the strain in the wood times the Young's modulus for the wood. And the stress in the steel equals the strain in the steel times Young's modulus for steel. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, what's going to make this a, a little easier for us, I guess, is the fact that the strains are equal. Okay? If we look at the interface for this point here, where the, um, the, the wood and the steel interact, the strain in the wood equals just the strain in general. The strain in the steel equals the strain in general. These strains are the same. Okay, So if the strains are the same, what I can do is I can maybe come up with this sort of relationship right here where there's a, a proportionality. You know, The stress in the wood compared to the Young's modulus in the wood equals the stress in the steel compared to the Young's modulus in the steel. So there is a definable relationship where we can relate the stresses in one uh, material to another if we start comparing their Young's moduli. Okay? Now, um, what we end up doing uh, in, the, uh, in the analysis is, again, the flexure formula is invalid for beams of, let's say, two materials. So what I'm going to do is transform it into a beam of one material. And I'm going to do that through the use of these Young's moduli, because we obviously know that the stress and the E values are related. And here's kind of how I'm going to do it. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at equilibrium, okay? Because equilibrium must be maintained. If I'm bending the beam and I don't have equilibrium inside the cross-section, the beam is running away from me, and that's not what's going to happen here. We're not in engineering 214 land. Uh, hopefully, I don't want to have a beam flying out of the uh, uh, support structure of this building, and we're going to have a bad day in here. All right, so um, I want to look at the steel plates. If we assume that the plates are relatively thin, then what we can do is say that the force in one of these steel plates is just the stress times the area, and the stress is E times the strain, so I can factor all that out a little bit. And just so you are aware, I am assuming relatively thin, just so I don't have to break out the calculus. To be clear, this derivation will still work if I assume arbitrary geometry, but just what ends up happening is we end up getting into calculus alphabet soup land, and I actually think it clouds the general understanding of what's going on. Okay? But just rest assured, this works regardless of whatever the, the beam looks like. Now, what we're going to do, let me go back a slide. So what we're going to do is we are going to transform this into a beam of one material. And for the sake of discussion, what we'll do is we'll say, instead of these steel plates on the top and bottom, let's replace them 
with equivalent wooden plates. Okay? Now, the way I have this drawn, the wooden plates are bigger, right? But wouldn't that make sense, right? Like if I have a beam and I'm using a certain size steel plate and I want to replace it with a, an equivalent wooden plate, well, that wooden plate's going to have to be a lot bigger to make up for the loss in the steel plate. In other words, I need a lot more wood than I do steel, right? I get a lot more bang for my buck with the, with the steel component. So now, how big do I make it, right? If I had a six inch wide steel plate, how wide does my wooden plate need to be so that I have an equivalent section? Well, I do that based on equilibrium. In other words, I propose that the um, force in the steel plate has got to equal the force in the wooden plate, okay? So EA times the strength, okay? And what I end up doing is this. So I set the area of my wooden plate equal to the area of my steel plate, and I say, what does the area need to be, or, or sorry, the force in the steel plate and the force in the wooden plate, I set them equal to one another so that equilibrium must be maintained, and what I get is this right here. So in other words, when I transform, what I end up doing is I had a steel plate before, what I'm going to do is to get the area of the equivalent wooden plate, I multiply it by this, this term N. An N is a modular ratio. It's the ratio of the Young's modulus for one material to the Young's modulus for another. We call that term N, the modular ratio. Now, N is usually defined as the Young's modulus for the stronger material divided by the Young's modulus for the weaker material. So, N values are usually bigger than 1. Does, does that make sense? It's like if I had wood and steel, um, the Young's modulus could be 20 or it could be like 0.05. And we typically take it the other way so that it's always bigger than 1. Okay? So what I'm doing is I'm going to take this wooden or this steel plate and transform it into an equivalent wooden plate. And then what I can do is compute the moment of inertia of that. Okay? And now it is a beam of a single material. And the means in which I transformed it was done in such a way that equilibrium was maintained. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Now, a couple things about Young's mo or about modular ratios. So again, we, sorry, let me, let me, before I, I skip ahead. So N, again, is the Young's modulus for the stronger material divided by the Young's modulus for the weaker material. It is typical in engineering practice to take that as a whole number. I mean, if, if you want, you could use a modular ratio of, you know, N is 7.876, da 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 But typically, we just say, just use N equals 8. Um, it is typical, typical in engineering practice just to round that up to the nearest whole number. You don't have to. If you want to be very scientific about it, you know, use that, that lower value. But more often than not, we just round to the nearest whole number. <coughs> Now, what gets funky is the stress computations. And this is where you kind of have to watch out, okay? Because, again, we, and, and it's easier to understand this in an example. And so we'll go through this example today, which is actually kind of involved and actually has a, a fair amount of computations to it. So we kind of have to roll up our sleeves today. But when you're computing stresses, okay, you need to watch out for how you do it, okay? Because the transformation process is done so that we can get a usable moment of inertia. Okay? But when we compute stresses, we sort of have to go back to what it looked like before. Okay? So what ends up happening here, and, and we'll, we'll see this in our example today, is we end up having to adjust our stress formula by N dependent upon what, uh, which way we did our transformation. And what I mean by which way we did our transformation, I want to be clear that there are two equitable options that we could use for a transformation. For example, we, if we had a composite beam, we could turn it into an equivalent wooden beam by taking our steel plates and, make, uh, and making them bigger wooden plates, or we could do the transformation the other way around. We could take this, and take the web and make it thinner and get an equivalent steel beam. We would get different moments of inertia with these two options, okay? That's clear. 
Okay? But a couple of things worth mentioning. One, we can, when we look at beam deflections, we will get an equivalent flexural stiffness because I propose the EI for this and the EI for this will be the same. And that's what's going to matter for beam deflections. And two, when we compute stresses, we are going to sort of divide out that effect of N. It just depends on whether or not we're dividing in one case or multiplying by another. And it's easier to explain that with an example. So let's actually go through uh, an example. This is kind of an involved example. This one's going to take a little while, okay? So roll up your sleeves, I guess, and get ready for it. Now I'm going to um, pull up the uh, uh, notebook here because I really want to dig into this example. This one's kind of big. Okay, so I have a composite beam shown, and I thought for the purposes of discussion, what I would do is I would, um, uh, is I would report this uh, the same as, as our derivation. So we have a wooden beam that is made composite through the use of two steel plates. Okay? Now what I've done is I've provided a lot of data um, for each of these materials. So let's look at the wooden beam. I have a 10 inch wide by 12 inch tall wooden beam. Now I've also provided the E value for the wood and a sigma allowable. Because I, I do kind of like this problem because I, I want to look at it on the flip side. If I tell you what sigma allowable is, how much moment can it withstand? Because what you, where can you take that? Okay. Well, if I know sigma allowable, I can determine the maximum applied moment. If I know the maximum applied moment, and I know that this beam is going to be 20 foot long, how much force can I put on the beam before it becomes unsafe? And those are very common questions to ask an engineer. I, I mean, how unheard of would it be to say, hey, here's this beam, how much can it hold up? That's a pretty common question to ask. And in order to do that, what we would do is use sigma equals m and y over i to determine the maximum allowable moment, and then use some structural analysis to figure out the maximum allowable loads. So that's kind of where, uh, where this is uh, 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 headed. Right? Now for the steel, I've also given you some similar data. I, we know the dimensions of the plate, we know the Young's modulus for steel, and we know the sigma allowable. And so what I want to know is I want to know how much moment can be resisted by the wooden beam by itself, or the wooden beam uh, that's been made composite. So in other words, if I didn't use those plates at all, how much moment can this withstand? And how much benefit am I getting from those plates? And there's a, we gotta roll up our sleeves and pay attention to this. There's a lot of work to get to that. Um, but I really like this problem, because if you understand this, you understand what's going on, period. Okay, I'm gonna give everybody a second to uh, jot all this down, and then we'll, we'll get to it. I do want to be clear as you're jotting this out, these are two completely separate problems. These two right here, completely separate. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So let's look at the wooden beam by itself, okay? Now, 
In other words, let's ignore all this composite stuff that we did in our last uh, lecture and in the last homework. Doesn't exist. All we've got is the wooden beam. So I have a beam that is 10 inches wide and 12 inches tall. So So, let's test some understanding from the last couple of lectures. This is a um, homogeneous beam. So, none of this composite stuff applies. And we can use sigma equals my over i. And I made sure that, that sigma didn't look like an r because somebody... Decided to get very nitpicky about my sickness in the last lecture. It was a genuine question. What's that? It was a genuine question. Sure it was. <laughs> Although that doesn't look like an I. Let me fix that. Yeah, I got to fix that. What? <laughs> I love my job. Okay. Now. What can you tell me about a beam that's 10 inches wide and 12 inches tall in terms of this equation? Is there something that we can determine quite easily? I. I. And a moment of inertia for a rectangular beam is computed as? Dh cubed over 12. There we go. Which is 10 inches wide, 12 inches cubed. Over 12. Now this one I think I can do in my head because one of those 12s is going to cancel. So we got 12 times 12, 144 times 10, 1440. Yep. Another thing that's worth mentioning is that because this is a rectangular beam, we know where the centroid is. So we know that our C top and C bottom are the same, which is H over 2, which is 6 inches. So if we wanted, we could use our sort of breakaway expression and say M over S. And from these two, we know that S is going to be I over C, which is 1440 inches to the fourth over six inches, which is um, 240 cubic inches. Is that fair? So, we know that sigma allowable, so let's just make sure we're on the same page. We know that sigma allowable is what for the wood? Because this is a wood beam. It was, what, 1,000 PSI? Is that what I said? 1,000 PSI. <clears throat> we know that S is 240 cubic inches. And so, if we know that sigma max is M over S, then that's actually pretty easy. What we can say is M allowable is sigma allowable times S. So, 1,000 PSI, 240 cubic inches, and so that's 240,000. And what are the units for that? It's a moment, by the way. There we go. So if I wanted to maybe make that a little bit more usable, divide that by 12, and so what is 240,000? 20,000. Foot pounds, or dividing it by, sorry, dividing it by 12 will get 
20,000 foot-pounds, dividing it by another 1,000 will be 20 foot kips. So M allowable is 20 foot kips. What do you think? That's easy, right? And that's the easy one. Yeah, you're right. That's the easy one. The other thing that's worth mentioning is, so, there's a couple offshoots to this problem that I want to make sure conceptually that we understand. So we'll put this in our little thought bubble. So... Okay. One offshoot to this problem could be this. And this is just a potential offshoot, just to give you kind of an idea. What if I said, what is the maximum allowable P, right? Which is, I mean, that's a, that's a very reasonable question. Here's a beam. How much can it hold up before it fails, right? So what do you do? Draw a shear diagram for that. Draw a moment diagram for that. Take the maximum moment, set it equal to that, solve for P, right? All right that's easy, right? We just had a homework that had the construction of symbolic shear and moment diagrams. It's almost like there was a reason for that. I told you a long time ago, I don't throw symbolics out there unless there's a reason for it. This is a reason for it. With me so far? Okay. Another could be What if the fact that is a horrible Bob? What if the factor of safety was like one and a half? Like, in all honesty, what if that was the case? Well, then, if it was the case, use M allowable as Just do that. And so I'm throwing that out there just to make sure that, like, I'm not putting every single potential roadblock and hurdle into every example, but I do want you to think about, well, what if I throw a factor of safety in there? What if instead of asking you for maximum allowable moment, I ask you for maximum allowable load? They're not hard, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Do they have any questions on this? Because now we're going to get to the good stuff. Am I good to uh, move that up a little bit and get to some work? Okay. All right. Now let's look at the composite beam. Okay, now, the first thing to do with our composite beam is to recognize the following. So E for the steel was 30,000 KSI, and E for the wood was, what was that? 5,000? I don't remember. 2,000. So if that's the case, what we can do is compute a modular ratio. Uh, and typically what we do is we take E for the stronger material or stiffer material, I guess would be more, more accurate. But I think that the, that's a simple enough vernacular that we all understand it. And so in this case, that's going to be E for the steel.
which is 30,000, 2,000, or 15. So that's pretty, you know, reasonable between wood and steel. Like wood and concrete, concrete, or sorry, uh, concrete and steel, concrete has very different properties dependent upon what your mix design looks like. So it could be anywhere from like seven or eight to maybe like 10 or 12. I think in the example or the homework problem, I think N is 12. So I know for most bridges we use N is eight. So, so far, so good? Okay, so what that means is we are going to turn this wooden beam with these steel plates. And remind me, what were the, was it six by um, a half? We are going to turn that into this. So turning a steel plate into an equivalent wooden plate, we're going to need a big wooden plate. Now I want to talk a little bit about that, about what we're doing and why we're doing it? Okay. First off, help me out. The centroid for this plate, or this, sorry, for this composite beam over here on the left, is about right there. Same thing with this one right here. Right? Now, where is the centroid for each of these steel plates over here? They are right there and right there. What about on the transformed beam? Right here and right there. They're in the same place, aren't they? So, here's my question for you. Notice how in order to do the transformation, I made the steel plates wider. What if I made, what if I didn't make them wider? What if I made them taller? That would change where the centroid is, right? So this is the only way to transform the section to maintain the same location of the centroids of each of those plates. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Would the total centroids still be in the same place though? Because they're Yes, you're exactly right. So, uh, let me answer that a little bit more refined. For this beam, yes, because it happens to be symmetric, okay? But the whole point of doing the transformation is so that you are dealing with a beam of one material so that you can find the centroid of this, okay? Now, if the beam is not symmetric, like is the case with your homework assignment, you're going to have to do all that. With me so far? Okay. Now, we did not touch the central beam. This was still 10 by 12, or so 12, not half. 12. This is still 10 by 12. What are now the dimensions of this plate? How do we determine that? How wide is it? Well, It'd be 90. Why? Because it's this width times 15. And what's 15 times 6? 90. So this is now 90 by half. And so what we are doing, to be clear, is we are performing an analytical transformation a mathematical transformation so that we are analytically dealing with a beam of one material so that we can compute flexural properties. Okay? Now, unfortunately, you're not going to get away with this on the homework assignment, but we are going to have a little bit of a shortcut here today. 
Let's use our little thought bubble over here. What is the algorithm that we are going to use to compute the moment of inertia? Well, it's that, right? That's the algorithm. That's the, the parallel axis theorem. Could somebody remind me what is D in this expression? Say it again. Y minus Y bar. Okay? But let that is symbolically what it is. But let's have a little bit more of a context, a little bit more of an understanding as to what this means. What it means is the distance from, from ah, am I getting ahead of myself? From centroid of individual shape to centroid of composite shape. But don't we already know where the neutral axis is? Don't we already know where the centroid is for this beam? Isn't it right there? In other words, here's my point. I propose that this dimension right here is D for the top plate. That's what that dimension is. Can't we just look at it? What is that dimension going to be? What is that? So this is 12 inches tall, so that's 6. That's a half inch tall, so 6 and a quarter. Can I just look at it? So is it D for the top plate, 6 and a quarter, D for the bottom plate? I guess we could say negative 6 and a quarter. What is D for this middle beam going to be? Zero. So let me show you what I mean by that, by all of this. My table is going to get a lot smaller. So we have the top plate, we have the wooden beam, we have the bottom plate. So watch this. Let's just write down the moment of inertia. Let's just write down the area. Let's just write down the D. Let's just carry it out. Let's not do the A, A, Y, the A, Y, A, Y, I not D, and I, because we already know where the centroid is. Does that make sense? Let's just save ourselves some time. Somebody help me out. How are we going to determine the moment of inertia of this top plate? Well, it's going to be 90 times one half cubed over 12. What is 90 times one half cubed over 12? Anybody got an answer for that? It's zero point something. It's tiny. Everybody brought their Casio FX 115ES plus or similar signs of the calculator, right? Is everybody following along with what I'm doing here? Because I, I don't want to go barreling forward. 0.94? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm getting like 9375, but that's, you're right. That's going to be the same for the bottom plate, right? It's the same down here. I feel like I did that too fast. Did I, did I do that too fast? It's okay if I did. Like, tell me, you know, all I'm doing is I'm saying, you know, right here, BH cubed over 12 is 90 times 0 0.5 
cubed over 12. That's all that is. Okay. Now, what's the moment of inertia of the wooden beam? Oh, wait, didn't we already compute that? There we go, it's 1440. We already did that. We need the area of, of each. That's really easy. I can look at that. That's 45, that's 45, and that's 120. We could do the D for each, and we just did that. We just did that uh, together. This is six and a quarter. That's six and a quarter, and that's zero. Notice how I'm being maybe a little fast and loose with signs, like maybe I should say this is positive and this is negative, but why do I not care? I'm squaring it, it doesn't really matter. And so now all we do is I plus AD squared, I plus AD squared. Now this middle one, I can tell you, is going to be 1440. That one's pretty easy because the D is zero. These ones are going to be 1758.75. So when I sum these, I get... 49, 57.5 inches to the fourth. Does that make sense? So I is 47.9 inches to the fourth. And I'm going to make a, a little bit of an odd statement, but I think this is kind of important for later on in exam three land when we do um, uh, um, when we do beam deflections I'm gonna say corresponds to e e equals 2000 ksi what I mean by that is that moment of inertia is a, a valid value for an equivalent wooden beam so when we look at deflections and whatnot, and we need to use an E-value, that's the E-value that we use because we transformed it into a wooden beam. Good. Make sense? Because we're going to have deflection formulas that are going to have EI on the bottom. And so the I is easy. You just got to make sure you're, we're using the right E-value. So if we, what would have happened is if we made the wooden beam in the middle into an equivalent seal beam, this value would be smaller, but it would correspond to a bigger E value. So the EIs would be comparable. Does that make sense? All right, good with that? All right. I'm going to stop for a sec because I want to make sure that this makes sense. Very good. And does anybody need any time to catch up on writing? Okay. Now, let's dive in. Okay. I want to make sure that this, what we're about to do, makes sense. So I want to draw something. Okay? So, so here's our composite beam. And here's what's really going to happen. First off, first 
off, let's look at our strain profile. Our strain profile is consistent, if you will. Okay? Uh, in other words, we have compatible strains across the board. And so our strain profile looks like this. Ooh. Looks like this. Okay? Now what I want to do is I want to look at the stress profile. Now the stress profile is not going to do this. Okay? It's not going to do this. What's going to happen in the stress profile is we're going to have this. This is what's going to happen in the real world. What's going to happen with the stresses is that the stresses are suddenly going to jump up right there at the interface. Okay? And they're going to jump up because we now have a beam of a, of a stronger material. See, let me go back, let me drag this up a little bit. See, equilibrium, let me look at this. So equilibrium tells me that the force in this plate and the force in this plate have to be the same. The forces have to be the same. And if I suddenly go back to making this plate smaller, as it is in real life, then the stresses have to jump up so that we get the same force in both plates. So this is what's going to happen in real life. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, this is what this means, okay? We are trying to determine M allowable. This is what we're trying to determine, okay? Now, I've got a beam that consists of two materials, so I want you to sort of go along with me on this. Just, just bear with me. We're going to assume... Oh, by the way, hold on, hold on. Before I do that, let me, let me do this right here. Can anybody tell me, let's look at some distances. What is this distance right here? Or this one right here? What is that distance? And what is this distance? That matters. We'll start with the one on the left. What is this distance right here? Six inches. But what about this one over here on the right? Or sorry, the left. This one's six and a half inches. With me so far? Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to assume bless you. We're going to assume that the steel governs. And you're like, what does that mean? I'll show you why. So we're trying to determine an unknown bending moment. We have a y value. And what I'm using for the y value is the distance from the centroid to the worst case spot on the steel which in this case is six and a half inches. Does that make sense why I'm using six and a half? I'm going from the middle to the top of the steel. I have a moment of inertia of, as you said, 49.57.5 and a modular ratio of 15. Why am I talking about the modular ratio here? Why am I talking about that? Well, because I have a sudden jump in my stress profile. Does that, you see the jump? How much do you think that jump is by? By the factor of the modular ratio, right? Sound good? 
Here's what I'm talking about, okay? Now, one final point. What was the sigma allowable for the steel? What was that? What was that at the beginning of the problem? 18,000. Okay. Let's look at this data. Now, I propose that because we're looking at the steel, that what we're dealing with is sigma allowable, or sigma max, sorry, is my over i, but because we're dealing with this transform section and because of the jump in the stress profile, we're multiplying by n. Okay? We're multiplying by n, right, because we turned the steel into an equivalent block of wood. So we made it bigger. Right? That's why we're multiplying by n. All right? But what I'm interested in in this case is I'm interested in determining the worst case moment. Right, so what do I do to solve for moment? Multiply both sides by I, divide by Y, divide by N. So what do I get? I get uh, M allowable is sigma max times I over N times Y. Is that right? So let's check that out. And for the interest of, of simplicity, I'm going to leave it in inch pounds, and I'll show you why. But it's going to be a big number because it's in inch pounds. Somebody help me out on this. It's a big number. It's, a, uh, it's okay. So we'll say like 0.8. And the units are inch pounds. So, everybody okay with the math, right? Okay. Now let's talk about what this value means. What this value means is that if the steel is what's governing the behavior, we'll talk about that, what that means in a second, but if I am limited to a stress in the steel of 18,000 PSI, I can put that much bending moment on it before I start overstressing the steel. Is that okay? Okay. Now, I'm, a, I'm saying let's assume the steel governs. Here's what I mean by that. Where is the maximum stress in the wood going to be? It's going to be right here, like six inches up, right? So what's the stress in the wood? Let's ask that question. So, what is the resulting stress in the wood? Okay? And what I mean by that is this. Okay? Now, let's say we have a new problem where we know that the moment is 915230.8. We know the Y is 6 inches. We know the I is 4957.5. Okay. Now, 
Now, in order to determine the stress in the wood, what I'm going to use is my over i. Notice how I don't have an n. The reason I don't have an n is because I transformed the beam into wood. And right now I'm looking at the stress in the wood. So I don't need to incorporate n back again. I don't need to put that in there. So sigma max is pretty easy. I just plug and chug. So what is sigma max in the wood? So What do I get when I plug and chug this? Inches. 
I is 4957.5. So if sigma max is my over i, then all we got to do is say that m allowable is sigma allowable times i over y, which is. Now, when you chug this out, tell me what you get. Because I want to answer something, and then I want to go back to Mr. McDaniel's question. That's a good point. I got a value for this. It's big again. 826,250. Second. Okay. All right. So, let, I'm, I'm going to follow the logic. So, if what we did before is we said, let's assume the steel governs, we got a value, and then check the stress in the wood. We found out that was no good. Now what we're doing is we know the wood governs, so we get a value. Now, if I check the stress in the steel, can you see that whatever it is, it's going to be less than 18,000? Because this was the value of moment that generated 18,000 PSI in the steel. This is going to be less than that. It's probably going to be 17,000 or 16,000. If you want, we can check it, but it's going to be less. Does that make sense? So this is the maximum moment that the section can carry. Now, I would like to do a unit conversion on this, okay? Uh, so if I take this value and divide it by 12, what is it? Say it again. They got a Casio FX 115ES plus or similar scientific calculator on them? 68,854.2. 68,854 foot pounds. And then divide it by 1,000, what do we get? 68.85 foot kips. Is that, is that fair? All right. I promise I'm not avoiding your question. Just, just bear with me. So, let's just summarize. What are the answers to the problem? So, what was M max for the wooden beam alone? What was that at the very beginning? I think it was what, 20 foot hips? And so, M max, M max. For the composite beam is 68.85 foot kips. Does everybody see that? So so answer. Answer composite beam. I want to make sure everybody understands this. Everybody okay? Yeah. 
let me go back to what you were saying. And I'm going to answer your question a little indirectly. Okay? What we were trying to determine up here was which component governed the maximum moment, whether it's the wood or the steel. And honestly, it's kind of a guess, right? Because it depends on the dimensions, it depends on the material properties, etc. Okay? But I don't want you to lose sight of the big picture. It doesn't really matter all that much whether the wooden beam governs the capacity or the steel plates govern the capacity. Because there was an obvious benefit in putting the plates there, right? The wood beam by itself can only hold up 20 foot kits. By putting those steel plates there, we were bumping that capacity up a fair amount, right? So the question as to whether or not the steel governs the capacity or the wood governs the capacity, it's just a, it's just a math and stress check. And so you're honestly kind of just picking one and seeing which one works, okay? Th does that make sense? Did that kind of, I, I wanted to wait because I thought it would be easier to answer that question when we've got the values here. Now I want everybody to pay attention because i got something I want to bring up to help you on your homework this new Tuesday. So... Any questions, though, on this? I know this, I told you I said this is going to be a long example and there's a lot to it. Does anybody have any uh, questions about the concepts? Okay, I want to show you something because I want this to be crystal clear. And it's really about sort of like these two formulas right here. The formulas in blue. Okay, notice how what I'm doing for the steel is I'm multiplying by N and for the wood I'm not doing anything. Right? The reason is that we transformed the section into the wood. So we did our transformation to the weaker material. So the weaker material didn't get adjusted. The stronger material did by multiplying by n. What you are going to be doing on your homework assignment is backwards. You've got a steel beam and a concrete deck. And you're going to be turning the concrete deck into a steel deck. Okay? So what that's going to mean is that for the stress in the steel... The formula is going to be sigma equals my over i. But for the concrete, you're not going to multiply by n. You're going to divide by n. Okay? Because with what you're doing on the homework, you are converting the beam into a stronger material. So going back to concrete, what's going to happen is there's not going to be a jump in the stress like this. The stress profile isn't going to look like this. For your homework, this is what the stresses are going to look like. But for the homework, you've got a concrete deck and you've got a steel beam. Right? And so your stress profile is going to look something like this. It's going to go like this, that, but then here it's going to jump in. It's not going to jump out because you're taking the concrete and you're turning it. Because when you do your transformation, you're turning the concrete into an effective lump of steel, so you're making it smaller, right? So when you transform it back to turning it into stresses, you're making the component bigger so the stresses drop down as a result. Does that make sense? And again, it's just easy, like you've got all these different components, it's easier to just transform this one than it is to worry about the steel beam, right? Because all you think, what's the easiest thing to do to get it to a beam of a single material? Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions on this? I know this one will probably be a challenging homework. This is probably one of the more challenging homeworks of the semester. But I think that this homework is easier than the example that we did in class. So, so yeah. Sound good? That's all I got. I'll see you all on Tuesday. And for those of you... Hold on.